and that our first speaker this morning is, for those who were here last night would have heard her for the, the second time she was here in 2006, delivering a paper for Sister Alicia Zalmansk. And Sister Donata Farbanicek is Our Lady of Mercy nun, St. Faustina's Order. She was born in Poland and joined in 1995 in the congregation where St. Faustina lived out her religious life. This congregation is contemplative and act an active, founded to participate directly in the mission of God's mercy. From 210 to 213, she was assigned to a community to her community in Boston, and in 216 became, began a ministry of the propagation of the message of divine mercy at the National Shrine of St. John Paul II in Washington, D.C. And Sister Donata works as a member of a formation team accompanying candidates on the first stages of their religious life and also lectures internationally. So please put your hands together for Sister Donata. Good morning, everybody. Morning. Are we ready to begin? Beautiful. Let us start with a short prayer, asking the Holy Spirit to come down, fill our hearts with his peace, love, joy, light, to be with us. In the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. <coughs> Come, Holy Spirit, fill our hearts and kindle in our hearts the fire of your love. Please repeat after me. Come, Holy Spirit, fill our hearts and kindle in our hearts the fire of your love. One more. Come, Holy Spirit, fill our hearts and kindle in our hearts the fire of your love. Mary, Mother of Mercy and the Spouse of the Holy Spirit, Saint Faustina, Pray for us. Saint Patrick, pray for us. Amen. It's a great blessing for me to be here and uh, to see so many of you coming here to worship God in the mystery of his mercy. And now I see with my own eyes that Ireland is a country of God's mercy. Is it true? Yeah, your presence here gives a beautiful testimony to it. Yesterday we were talking about the image of the divine mercy of the merciful Jesus, and we focus on the words, Jesus, I trust in you. I think this is the only image in the world that Jesus himself wanted to be painted. And he said to Saint Faustina that, that these words, Jesus, I trust in you, he wants these words as an inscription on this image. Jesus, I trust in you. This image is like a letter of our Lord to each one of us. So that, that is why every element of this image is very important. And I said, it's not just a man-made artwork. It's a sacred space. This image is a sacred space. 
the Lord in invites each one of us to meet with him as our merciful father meets his beloved child. And now we come to a question today. When we are talking about trust, what reality are we referring to? What is the ground that we are moving on? This is the very reality that characterized the relationship that Adam and Eve had with God. The loving father and his children, they were completely open to him, in deep friendship and union with him, obedient out of love, transparent before him, and with no division. When, with no division between God and them and between each other. Complete trust and no questioning. And now something happened. Satan comes to deceive them, to get them. He takes a form of their benefactor and he starts, is it true that God said is it true that God said very smart way and very effective? It's so effective that Satan hasn't changed it throughout the ages. The same way of temptation to question our Lord and his word. The bottom line for Satan is always to destroy our relationship with God as our father. And how? By killing our trust in him. To switch from trust to distrust. And for us, it might be hard to imagine because we are people already wounded with original sin. but maybe an image of a good friendship, a relationship based on love and trust could be a good image for us to imagine what really happened when we have very close, deep relationship with someone and then this person starts showing us distrust and starts questioning us. It hurts, it's re it really hurts. This is the effect of original sin. And we know that fir the first sin, original sin, was an act of disobedience. But first of all, it was distrust that brought them to, to show disobedience to our Lord. Distrust that everything what God had said truly was their greatest good. Following Satan's insinuation, they started questioning God's word. From that moment on, every person carries this wound of distrust in his, her heart. Now, what happens? They hide themselves before God. They are afraid of him. They feel separated from him. They are focused on, on themselves and no longer keep their eyes fixed on the Lord. Through original sin, we lost something that was essential and critical to our relationship with God. We lost trust. Adam and Eve started organizing their life on their own. Basically, they lost their freedom, the freedom of the children of God, who were completely out of love, dependent on him. So to trust means to live out our identity as the beloved children of God. This is very important. 
to trust means to live out our identity as the beloved children of God, of whom he takes care, whom he guides. A beautiful model of this full of trust relationship is our Lord Jesus and his relationship toward his Father when he says, I and the Father are one and my food is to do the will of the one who sent me. And now we come to the question, how can we learn to trust? How to form our hearts to become full of trust? The short answer is to ask for this gift, to ask our Lord to help us to place our trust in him, to restore this attitude of trust in our hearts. But on our part, we need to cooperate with him. First, we need to examine ourselves. Where is the wound, my wound? Where is the place that is blocking my self-surrender to God? Where is the crack through which evil one has an easy access to me? These are very, very important questions. Maybe it's for some of us a need to control or a need to be independent from God and from others or to give into fear, or maybe things of rituals that we don't want to let go of. I remember once we visited a Catholic family, and when we came to their house, there was a pretty big statue of Buddha in the center of their house. and. Uh, their daughter was, is a good friend of ours. And I asked her, I said, what, what does it mean? And she said, well, for good fortune. No, there will be no good fortune out of it. There will be no blessing. We have our God, our triune God, and no one besides him can give us any security. So it's good to see what prevents me from saying from the bottom of my heart, Jesus, I trust you and completely surrender to God, both in everyday ordinary life situations and uh, extraordinary circumstances. But to clarify, sometimes we can catch ourselves that we are saying, Jesus, like there is a problem in our lives. There is something that we are struggling with. And then we come to the Lord and we say, Lord, I know you, only you can solve my problem. But we already have a pre-prepared solution. Lord, but this is the way, right? I trust you that you can do it, but my way. No, we, we know it, 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 it doesn't work this way. Jesus, I trust in you is like I surrender. You know better. You have a plan. You... Like for me, when I was preparing myself for this, uh, sharing this reflection, I was thinking like, what is this about? The Lord wants to bring me back home to heaven and his will is like a map, right? Like he knows the road, the shortest road with no detours. So this is what his will is about, to bring me back home to heaven. 
the only thing I need to do, what he asked me of, is to surrender, like to abandon myself to his guidance as my father, right? As a child surrenders uh, himself to his father. And we have beautiful examples. We have many saints, and first of all, Blessed Mother, today is Saturday, so Blessed Mother is very tangibly with us today, even this beautiful weather. I know that it's not obvious in Ireland. The beautiful sky, clear sky. And Blessed Mother is this outstanding example for us because when we look at her life and we know her life from the Gospels, like everything was going pretty normal in according to our human terms until the moment of the Annunciation. From that moment on, like nothing worked in a normal way, what we would say normal, like humanly speaking. God took over and she surrendered. We know that she placed the word of God in the very center of her heart. She pondered it and she followed it. The word of God. When we examine our conscience, we see how often instead of meditating the word of God and placing the word of God in the center of our hearts, we instead meditate human words, especially those uh, which hurt us. And sometimes we spend not just hours, but weeks and days and maybe years, like meditating of what someone uh, said to us. Blessed Mother is giving us this beautiful example, the word of God in the very center, in her heart, life, mind, because this, this word is Jesus himself. This is the living word, the eternal word that has the power to create. Some time ago, I found short videos about uh, the disaster, you know, like a few, they describe a few disasters in the Himalayas. What happened with the climbers uh, during their like, last stage of climbing, of reaching the, the top of the mountain, different uh, in, in the Himalayas. And what really struck me was um, because in a like, very detailed way, they described how those climbers were navigated from the base. There was a navigator person in the base and like giving uh, instructions to the climbers. And as I was listening to, to it, I realized this is a very accurate analogy to the Word of God. Why? Because this navigation was about death or life. It was like, okay, now go a few meters straight. And so this climber is saying, I'm exhausted. I don't think I will make it. Okay, take two pills. You have them in your backpack. Very detailed. You know, so these words for him to obey were not optional. It's not like, okay, it doesn't matter whether I listen to it or not. No, it was the matter of life or death. And it made me think, yes, this is very similar to the word of God. The word of God is not optional for us. This is the Lord's navigation through this, you know, darkness of our life on the earth. 
The Lord shows us the way, where to go, where not to go, and how to get, you know, how to reach the peak, right? Our home in heaven. Also, Sister Faustina is uh, this human outstanding, outstanding example of trust. We know that her name was Sister Maria Faustina of the Blessed Sacrament, and the mystery of Jesus in the Eucharist was in the center of her life. And of course, the Sacrament of Reconciliation as the preparation uh, for the Eucharist. Jesus instructed her, when you approach the confessional, know this, that I myself am waiting there for you. I am only hidden by the priest, but I myself act in your soul. Here the misery of the soul meets the God of mercy. And in another place, were the soul like a decaying corpse, the Lord said, so that from a human standpoint, there would be no hope of restoration and everything would already be lost. It is not so with God. The miracle of divine mercy restores that soul in full. When you go to confession to this fountain of my mercy, the blood and the water which come forth from my heart always flows down upon your soul and ennobles it. This is the reality of every confession. When we go with sincere heart, when we are totally open before the Lord, he is waiting. He said, a priest for me is just a screen, but it is I myself who is waiting there for you. And he absolves Jesus himself give us his absolution. So, the sacrament of reconciliation is a preparation for us to be united with the Lord in the Eucharist. We know that we cannot receive Eucharist being in a state of mortal sin. We need confession and frequent confession. I want to share with you something very personal. In our congregation, we have uh, confession every two weeks uh, and probably like over a year ago I was talking to a friend of ours of our community uh, and he's a very a man very advanced spiritually and he said to me sister I think it would be good you know if you go like every week to confession and I thought every week to confession, and he said, of course, a priest will think that you are a religious nut, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but he says, like, don't worry about it, like, try. And I think, like, the, the grace of God was at work when he was saying this, he convinced me. So, like, over a year ago, I started going to confession, let's say, every week, every 10 days, I have to testify tremendous grace, tremendous grace. Sometimes like I see like the Lord gives me peace. This is one thing. The other thing is he strengthens me. After confession, there are different situations like life goes on. Sometimes I'm surprised that I react in in such a way, I said, wow, that was not of me. I, I experienced the power of, of the sacrament. When we draw life directly from Jesus, we as Catholics in the Catholic Church, we have the sacraments. Sometimes we, we don't see their, of course we don't see their full value, but I would say we don't appreciate them the Lord gives us, he himself meets us in the sacraments and we draw life directly from him. So, 
reconciliation, sacrament of confession prepares us for the Eucharist. And Faustina shares with us in her diary, I, I was transported in spirit to the chapel where I saw the Lord Jesus exposed in the monstrance. In place of the monstrance, I saw the glorious face of the Lord. And he said to me, what you see in reality, these souls see through faith. Oh, how pleasing to me is their great faith. You see, although there appears to be no trace of life in me, in reality it is present in its fullness in each and every host. But for me to be able to act upon a soul, the soul must have faith. Oh, how pleasing to me is living faith. How pleasing to me is living faith. And on another place. After communion today, Jesus told me, Faustina recorded, how much he desires to come to human hearts. I desire to unite myself with human souls. My great delight is to unite myself with souls. Know, my daughter, that when I come to a human heart in Holy Communion, my hands are full of all kinds of graces which I want to give to the soul. But souls do not even pay attention, but souls do not even pay any attention to me. They leave me to myself and busy themselves with other things. Oh, how sad I am that souls do not recognize love. They treat me as a dead object. So, our trust, we have to say that our trust is not somewhere, as we said yesterday, it's not about having good emotions, right? When we are in the time of consolation and we can say easily, Jesus, I trust in you, uh, you are my Lord, I praise you. Trust is very tangible. And to trust in the Lord means simply to do his will. To surrender ourselves to God in our daily life. I trust in your will, Lord. I trust your plan. This is all that matters. And as we said, the will of God is to save us, to bring us back home to heaven, and the Lord has a plan, he has a map, how to bring us back to heaven. This is what his will is about. Where can we find it, right? Because we may have questions, okay, I want to fulfill God's will, but where can I find it? We have the 10 commandments. This is clearly God's will for us. 10 commandments. Duties of our state in life. If I am a religious sister, I should be who I am, right? If I am a mother, a father, a student, a nurse, a priest, I should be who I am to fulfill the duties of my state in life. God's will also we find in the evangelical councils. We have the gospel, the good news. This is the will of, of God for us. Also the inspirations, of the, the inspirations of the Holy Spirit and complete surrender to God's providence. Sister Faustina has 
one entry in her diary when she shares her uh, dialogue, question and the answer of the souls from purgatory. She said, in the evening when I was walking in the garden saying my rosary and came to the cemetery, the graveyard, I opened the gate a little and began to pray for a while and I asked them interiorly, you are very happy, are you not? Then I heard the words, we are happy in the measure that we have fulfilled God's will. We are happy in the measure that we have fulfilled God's will. And we know that Sister Faustina was striving to fulfill God's will. That was her spiritual work constantly, to fulfill God's will in every detail, not just in general, but in every detail, to be obedient to, to her duties, to be obedient to the inspirations of the Holy Spirit that she recognized in her heart. And in the diary, there, there are two pages, blank pages. If you would like to check, it's the number 374. We can say the most important pages in the diary. Crossed out, one of them is crossed out. And she said, from today on, my will doesn't exist. I will not fulfill my will. So, and her will is crossed out and the other page is blank. From today on, I will fulfill God's will always and everywhere and in everything. Can we do it on our own? What do you think? Can we? Of course, of course, the Lord says, without me, you can do nothing, right? Without me, you can do nothing. And I think we shouldn't even try to do it, you know, as our spiritual workout, right? Like I will do it with my spiritual muscles. No, we should humble ourselves every day, every day. Lord, I'm not able, but I won't help me and cooperate with grace. An effort is necessary from our, you know, on our part. Lord, help me, this is my desire, to follow you, to do your will. I know that my time is over, uh, almost, almost, but at the end, I want to share with you just a few words about Father, maybe you heard, I bet you heard about Father Walter Ciszek, a Polish-American Jesuit, who wrote two books, one with God in Russia and the other, He Leadeth Me. Who knows these books? Okay, okay, so some of you uh, know these books. I would say, you know, Number one is the Bible, of course, the Holy Scriptures, then the diary, and these two books, very inspirational. Very interesting story. So Father Walter Ciszek, he spent five years in solitary confinement in Moscow, in prison. He was suspected to be a Vatican spy. They forced him, forced him after a year of night sessions of interrogation to sign forged documents. He said that I felt they broke me. I was in despair and the whole long reflection and suffering brought him to the point when he said, I realized I was counting on myself. And one experience of Jesus who suffers in agony in, in Gethsemane, 
That was a turning point in his life. He said that was a moment of death and resurrection. And he said, I chose consciously and willingly to abandon myself to God's will. And he shared, for me, however, there could be no doubt the fullest freedom I had ever known, the greatest sense of security came from abandoning my will to do only the will of God. What was there to fear so long as I did his will? Not death, not failure, except the failure to do his will. For if God is with us, who can stand against us? Merciful Lord, we beg you, give us the grace of complete trust in your mercy and self-abandonment to your holy will. Amen. Thank you.